I think we, we, we want to build a moon base, moon base alpha, um, and have a permanently uh, occupied uh, base on the moon. Like that would be super exciting. Um, and so you'd have a bunch of ships that are specialized for going to and from the moon, but they never come back to, uh, they never land back on Earth. They just would, would uh, dock with uh, propellant, propellant tankers to get uh, orbital refilling. So in terms of performance, we've made um, dramatic progress on, on every level for Starship. Uh, it's remarkable that uh, we can see the Raptor engines and how, how, it, how it has evolved from, you know, optimistically 185 tons to 280. And I think ultimately we'll probably, the booster engines, we'll, we'll aim to get the booster engines over 330 tons of thrust, which would mean 10,000 tons of total thrust at liftoff. So, uh, and then the Raptor 3 also will not need a heat shield. So Raptor 3 looks, looks very simple, and it is actually simplified in a lot of ways. Um, but a lot of the complexity is hidden because we have integral cooling channels uh, in, in many parts of the engine that, that don't exist in Raptor 2. So in order to not have a heat shield, it has to be very resilient. Um, but that is actually what Raptor 3 would look like. It looks like Raptor 3 looks like it's missing a bunch of parts. Uh, but actually, those parts have either been deleted or they've been integrated into the system, and like I said, with integral cooling channels. Um, and where you, where you need secondary plumbing, the secondary plumbing has also been integrated uh, into the pump and into the, the chamber jacket. And um, yeah, so it's uh, much simpler. Well, it's, 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 yeah. It's actually extremely difficult to build Raptor 3, but. Um, but it will be easy to integrate and will have higher performance and lower total mass um, and be more reliable. So. around 40 or 50 tons to orbit. Um, so the current design, Starship 2 will be over 100 tons, and then Starship 3 will be over 200 tons. Um, and uh, yeah, it's uh, going from around 7,000 tons thrust to over 8,000. And I think we'll, we'll, we'll end up ultimately with more than, more, more than 10,000 tons of thrust, um, probably seven or 8,000 tons of liftoff mass. And at least 10 meters taller, we'll see. <laughs> Tends to grow. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so it probably grows a bit more than that even, really. Um, so if you, if you look at Falcon 9, it's, it's very, we're not going to do the length to diameter of Falcon 9. That would be crazy. But uh, Falcon 9 is a very long rocket. Um, and uh, so w I suspect it'll probably get a bit longer than this. But at, w at 200 tons per flight, fully reusable, um, that, is, that is pretty incredible. And uh, yeah. This will be on the order of 500 feet tall. Um, and then we're, we're there's, there's, hundred, there's thousands of design improvements here. So I mean, the, I think maybe the most, one of the most profound things is Starship 3 will cost less per flight than Falcon 1. So that's the difference between if you've got a fully reusable rocket or an expendable rocket. Um, the fully reusable rocket with low cost propellant and autogenous pressurization uh, actually costs less than a, a, a tiny expendable rocket. So, and it'll do 
like I said, Falcon 1 is about half a ton to orbit. The Starship 3 will be 400 times more payload for less than the cost of a Falcon 1. Um, ultimately, I think we, we might be able to get the cost per flight to Earth orbit down around $2 million or $3 million. So uh, th these are sort of unthinkable numbers uh, from the, you know, no, nobody ever thought that this was possible, but we're not breaking any physics to achieve this. Uh, so this is within the balance, with, without breaking physics, we can do this. What this diagram is basically saying is that uh, for getting to Mars, we would um, essentially uh, create a kind of a propellant depot ship. The propellant depot would look more like a hot dog than like a spear. Um, it's really just a, a long ship with a lot of insulation. And uh, we'd fill that ship up. And then shortly before, or, or as, as they're going to Mars, the ships would take off with, I don't know, a couple hundred tons of payload from Earth, reach orbit with very, almost no propellant, and then uh, get refilled by the tanker, uh, and then go to Mars and, and land go all the way to Mars with over 200 tons of useful payload. Then on Mars, in the beginning, we would, I think we would simply reuse the ship materials. So most of the ships wouldn't come back. But then over time, you'd want to bring the ships back so you could reuse them. And, um, and for that, we would need to create uh, methane, CH4, and oxygen, O2, on Mars, which you can do with uh, H2O and CO2. So the atmosphere is CO2, and there's plenty of water ice, H2O. And so it's, it's kind of like tailor-made for, well, we actually, the reason we have a methane oxygen system is because you can make methane and oxygen on Mars fairly easily, like not, uh, just not a total walk in the park, but the ingredients are red readily available to create methane and oxygen on Mars. So, so you build a propellant depot and, and bring the ships back and build out as quickly as possible a self-sustaining civilization on Mars. And we want, to get the, we want to get the cost of going to Mars such that almost anyone could afford it. So like if somebody were to just work hard on Earth, save up, and that they'd be able to go to Mars. So it's like anyone, ideally, almost anyone could go to Mars. And I think you'll see a lot of governments also sponsor people. Um, and ultimately, we'll, we'll want to get And then long term, we'll probably have some offshore launch sites. So you can just imagine all of these starships waiting in orbit for the planets to align, and then this gigantic star fleet taking off from Mars.